Welcome back after the break. Uh, as you can see, that's where we finished uh, the morning session. We started off with this uh, example on this uh, moral dilemma, the trolley car example, which we then further elaborated uh, or made different uh, variations. And this led us to the fact that uh, it mi there might be a necessity to take into account different perspectives. Uh, maybe not only legal or a policy perspective, but also an ethical perspective, maybe uh, also other ones. And uh, we then moved on to the definition of law, different characteristics of law, separation of powers, hierarchy of law, first in general. Then uh, we discussed that with regard to the European Union, and that is where we finished uh, when talking about the decision-making process uh, in European Union law, which if you take the, the, this notion of lobbying, which I mentioned here, concerning all steps, hopefully except for the, the last one. So also here we could obviously discuss certain issues uh, of ethics in lobbying, which very often uh, is linked to asymmetric information. So that uh, certain <coughs> stakeholders have different information which they can also use. Uh, also different uh, resources and so in the end there could be situation which is deemed to be unethical. But uh, I want to bring you another example which I just found during uh, lunch break uh, on today's uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, and that's another perspective which uh, some of you uh, already uh, entered into the debate. So not only law, ethics but also religion which we are going to cover most likely at the end of uh, today's afternoon session. And I already mentioned <coughs> that Essex very often enters the debate if we are talking about new technologies. Why? Because uh, the process that I just mentioned now with decision making often is very slow. If you remember, if we need to change EU primary law, we need a consensus of all 28 member states, which means we always need the consent of the government, maybe also parliament, maybe even a referendum, so asking citizens. And that question has to be decided in each and every single of the 28 member states. And if at least in one country we need a referendum, always in Ireland, then it's very likely uh, that this process would A, not come to an end, or or that it simply would take too long, even if it's successful. And therefore, uh, and we don't only need to talk about EU primary law, also if we talk about secondary law, which at national level would equal uh, ordinary legislation, uh, very often the law lags behind certain new developments. And artificial uh, intelligence, <coughs> and we also discussed uh, the issue of self-driving cars, so two very important topics nowadays where we have very fast uh, te technological development but the law lags behind and so what is discussed here and I just wanted to bring it as one example is the, f uh, the fact or is the question how should those gaps be filled and here we have <coughs> this uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop uh, of Oxford Stephen Croft who in this article where he's interviewed argued well, those gaps should not be filled uh, with Silicon Valley, uh, or, or sh should not be filled by following the Silicon Valley route, but it should be filled uh, with ethics. And as I said, we need to distinguish law, policy, ethics, and also religion. So he obviously argues that it should be ethics based on Christian uh, philosophies, how those gaps should be filled. Uh, filled. But still, I want you to keep all those uh, different perspectives apart and then obviously it also depends on your personal attitudes how one argues that those gaps should be filled. Okay? So that's just to again highlight the importance of uh, having those uh, different perspectives and that is just one current example where we have one opinion and obviously there can be different opinions on this issue. Coming back to what we covered in the morning session, are there any questions from your side concerning the examples that we had, the definitions, or now the decision-making process? 
as I said, lobbying can enter the stage uh, even before the Commission drafts a proposal. But then it's not the Commission acting in the interest of the whole European Union that needs to adopt this law, EU secondary law, but it's Parliament representing the interests of the citizens and uh, the Council of Ministers representing the interests of uh, the member states, which then formally, so both of them together, have to adopt this piece of EU secondary law, whether it's a directive or a regulation, as you already know, having different legal effects. So th let's therefore turn uh, to these two videos that you were asked to prepare. The first video, that was the video from the website of uh, the Council of Ministers, or as it's officially named, the Council of the EU. What was mentioned in this video? So, as I've now described the decision-making process very briefly, let's have a look, a uh, little bit a closer look on uh, those two videos and thereby the decision-making process. So, the first video about the Council video, what did it mention? How many institutions are in... Yeah? Yeah, so if we have this, what is called the, the normal procedure here, it's called the ordinary legislative procedure. We nowadays, and that has not been the situation in the past, have, as, as I just mentioned before, an equal situation of parliament, citizens' interest, and council of ministers, member states' interest. That has not been uh, the situation in the past. So at the very beginning of EU history, parliament uh, had a very minor role, and it was the council of ministers deciding. Take uh, current uh, conflicts uh, in the Middle East. If not the EU decides, but the, uh, the United Nations, the Security Council, it's just <coughs> member state representatives who decide. And what other difference do we can we observe for the United Nations? Every member state having an equal say in that institution? No. So the permanent members, yeah, they have a veto right, which does not exist in the Council of Ministers, but there is a veto right, uh, and it's only a institution representing the member states' interests. So here we don't have uh, the European Parliament. Uh, this is again for the decision making. We have three institutions: the Commission, EU interests, Parliament, citizens' interests and the Council of Ministers, and at the very beginning of EU history, as I said, the Parliament had, a, uh, had rough, rather no say, and then during the course of time, the, the powers of Parliament ha, uh, have been increased and increased, and nowadays, since the Lisbon Treaty, we can say that for the one procedure which applies for the biggest number of cases, which is called the ordinary legislative procedure, so nowadays we have an equal say between European Parliament and Council of Ministers. What else was mentioned in this first video from the Council's website? Yeah? That during the decision making process there are several readings, I think three. Yeah, yeah. yeah and if they, like, I can't remember what was the last stage. Two readings and the last one was like. The conciliation. Yeah. yeah, conciliation committee. So we don't need to go too much into, into details, uh, just to mention that. Parliament drafts uh, its opinion and then the Council drafts its opinion. If they match, then we have uh, an adopted legal act. F first round uh, or chance where they can find a compromise, we have a second one. And in the last one they would sit together because before they're, they're meeting in separate buildings. In the last uh, round they're sitting together like a smaller number of each side, Parliament, Council. And obviously if you sit together, you might, uh, it might be more likely that you find a compromise. What you should know about uh, decision making in, in Brussels is also that very often we have a theoretical solution, but in <coughs> reality it works slightly different. Now what is that uh, different situation that really takes place? As I said, in theory they meet always separately. There's also something which is called informal trilogues, 
Why informal? Because it's not foreseen in the treaties. Why trilog? Because there's three stakeholders involved. Obviously, Parliament and Council, but as it's three of them, trilog, it's also the Commission because they have made the proposal. And so although they would meet in separate meetings, separate buildings, but they would informally in between meet and see, well, how can we find a compromise? And that's uh, a procedure, again, which is not foreseen in the treaties. Um, it's very helpful because it helps to find a compromise very early on. So most of the time decisions are already taken in, uh, in the first reading. Uh, but sometimes those informal trilogues are criticized because they're very, they're intransparent. If officially the parliament meets, if there are any meetings, you can get all the documents, you can uh, have a look at the at live screen, so it's really very transparent for the parliament, not so much for the council. But those informal trilogues, as the name already indicates, the informal, uh, they are sometimes not as transparent, which again can be a problem for democracy uh, and also for citizens' trust. Who, how, oh sorry, how is the work of the council prepared? Is it the three main institutions uh, we already <coughs> discussed before the break, how they are composed. <coughs> I also mentioned, bless you, the interests which are represented uh, in those uh, institutions. The so-called ordinary legislative procedure, formally it was called co-decision because parliament and council decide uh, together. Uh, you mentioned the different readings and also statistics. I told you that uh, due to this informal trilog, we have a, a compromise very early on. Uh, there are also other procedures. And what, is, uh, what else is mentioned in this video? So how is the work of the council prepared? And why was it mentioned with regard to the council and not with regard to other institutions? Corepair, yeah, that's a French acronym. It <coughs> Does anyone know? Comité des représentants permanents. So, Committee of Permanent Representatives. <laughs> Sorry for maybe not pronouncing correctly. <laughs> um, and what's that, Corepair? Committee of Permanent Representatives. Mm, they are like the employee, employees of the, uh, of the council, and they um, prepare the work for the council. Yeah. Yes. So if we all, if you all know that uh, the EU institutions are mainly not only mainly located in Brussels, the Parliament or the members of Parliament they work in, in Brussels also in Strasbourg, so they commute between those two cities. Uh, the council is located in uh, Brussels. Some departments in, in Luxembourg uh, and uh, the Commission is mainly located in Brussels so they are permanently on site. <coughs> the ministers obviously uh, they work in, the, in their capital cities in Paris, in uh, Rome, in, in Vienna, uh, whatever and so they need someone who is on site to prepare their meetings and that's the co-repair so those are ambassadors not to Belgium, not to the King of Belgium, but uh, to the EU and they prepare, they do all the preparation, they would have those informal trilogues with Commission and with Parliament because they're permanently, co-repair, they're permanently on site and they do all the preparation. Then obviously it's the ministers who fly in from uh, their capital cities which then officially have to vote in favour or against a certain proposal. So that's the uh, preparation of the council work, which has also been mentioned in the one video. What about the second video of the European Parliament? What does it mention? Who has the so-called right of initiative? The Commission. Exactly, as I said, that's the European Commission. Why is that important? Because they can uh, give a proposal of a, of a law. They can um, do some research about the proposal. And yep. uh, the proposal can come also from uh, uh, at least uh, one million citizens. Yeah, 
So it, the principle or right of initiative means that it's the European Commission only, not Parliament, not Council, who can make a proposal for a new law. Parliament and Council, they can just invite the Commission to make a proposal, but still, if the Commission does not like to, f to present a proposal, they, uh, there's nothing they can do. What we have now, and that's new since the, the Lisbon Treaty, we have the EU Citizens Initiative, where one million EU citizens from at least seven EU countries can, make a, uh, can ask the Commission, invite the Commission to make a proposal. For example, there was recently a European Citizens Initiative in South Tyrol, uh, a, min a minority safe pack, uh, an initiative which uh, strived to, to strengthen uh, the rights of minorities. As you know, there, uh, there is a German-speaking minority in the northern part of Italy, which is called South Tyrol. Uh, but still, it's the right of the Commission to make such an initiative or not to make an initiative. So, a proposal for a new law. Um, it also refers to this video to the process before a proposal is presented. I already mentioned that on the previous slide. Also the process once a proposal has been presented. So those are the, the different readings which have already been mentioned. Um, what else does this video mention? One very important issue. Even if the Commission is willing to make a new proposal, and now let that be on artificial intelligence, on uh, self-driving cars, on whatever, maybe on even improved uh, data protection rules, uh, social media, whatever you like, only under which precondition can the European Commission make a new proposal? Exactly, and so uh, if we go back one slide, yes, at the very first stage, stage it's not only uh, important to find out what uh, does the industry think about that proposal or other key stakeholders, just to also to see not whether they like it, but uh, basically whether um, it would work, whether the objectives could be fulfilled by this proposal. Uh, it's also about obviously finding out whether Parliament and Council would, uh, would agree to that proposal because it, there is no use in drafting a proposal which you know that would never be accepted by the Member States or by the Parliament. So if both of them have to agree, if one of them doesn't like it, it could never be adopted. So therefore no use drafting such a proposal. But still, what, what is uh, still important before the Commission drafts a proposal? What do they have to keep in mind? Could they make a proposal on anything? Yeah, they have to see if they're competent first. Exactly, so very good. They, they have the, uh, the first question which they have to answer is, so if the Commission, is at, if they want to make a proposal, they have to answer the question, the whole European Union, are they competent uh, to <coughs> regulate on that particular issue, if the answer is yes, then they can make a proposal. If the answer is no, uh, then uh, it would not be adopted by Parliament and Council. Or even if it's adopted, the Court of Justice could decide, no, sorry, but the EU is not in charge of that issue, therefore uh, we cannot have a directive or regulation on whatever new issue. So this leads us to uh, to this uh, question about uh, who is in charge. What was mentioned, uh, what are the issues where the EU is not in charge? Foreign affairs. Well, foreign affairs we have, uh, maybe the, the Italians uh, uh, would argue that you're not right because it's even an Italian lady who is in charge of foreign affairs. But it's more representative of the legislation. So we have uh, Federica Mogherini, who is in charge of foreign affairs, or as it's called, the high representative for foreign affairs or external relations. Um, but obviously, she cannot take any, every decision. So if you take current conflicts uh, in the north of Africa, she cannot make up her mind and the EU would follow. But obviously, she has to align her position, which especially the big countries and those who are, have a strong military force like France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Poland, 
otherwise, uh, her proposal will not be followed. Yeah. What other issues? Yeah, so social security, uh, at EU level it's on only coordinated, so we have certain rules on social security, very important ones, uh, but they can only coordinate, so they can, for example, if you all work all of your life uh, in Austria, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, but one year uh, of your life you have been working in France, who would pay your pensions? Well, you would get a pension from Austria and obviously if it was only one year, a smaller one from France. So it's not harmonized, so we don't have equal rules and social security rights might be different in France than in Austria, but at least it's coordinated, not harmonized, less coordinated, so that you would uh, get pension payments uh, for the one year from France, less amount, and if in the rest of your life you have been working in Austria, then obviously that would be more money that you receive from Austria. Taxation is a very another issue where the EU has only limited competences. Um, public health, right? Public health, yes, that's also an issue which is mainly still uh, a national competence, but we do find certain provisions on public health. So what we have to distinguish is uh, three types of competences. And I, mean, I promise you not to go too much into details, so just that you have an idea about the most important <coughs> issues. As I said, especially insofar as you're going to need it for the online sessions. So, and that's very important. At the very beginning, all com competencies were here at the level of the member states. So at the beginning, the European Union had not a single competence, or how, how uh, this organization was called in previous times, so what we call nowadays the European Union. At the beginning it had absolutely no competences. And only step by step certain competences have been transferred to the European level. Because I just mentioned public health. Uh, does anyone of you know, now from a policy perspective, what has to happen so that member states are willing to transfer new competences to the European level? Exactly, so legally speaking, all 28, and, and again, that's differentiating different uh, perspectives. Legally speaking, it's easy. If we change primary law, because this distribution of competences we can find in EU primary law, and as you already know, all 28 have to agree. Very good, that's the legal perspective. But from a policy perspective, political science if you wish, what has to happen so that the member states are willing to transfer new competences to the e to EU level? Very easy, you need a major crisis. Because you mentioned public health, like as we, for example, had the BSE crisis, uh, member states only then were willing to transfer additional, so only very small competences in the field of public health to EU level. HIV AIDS was also a major crisis. Only after that crisis, member states were willing <coughs> to transfer not all competences for public health, but <coughs> just tiny pieces, if you wish, to the European level. And so nowadays <coughs> we can distinguish three types of competences. Yeah. So we have patient mobilities and there's also types of public health, but I wouldn't say that there's a crisis with patient mobilities. Uh, not a crisis, but uh, in this case, uh, that rather uh, I'm very thankful for for this statement. It it I would link it to another topic which I uh, emphasized earlier. Uh, patient mobility in the European Union has not been... Who should create patient mobility if we take the separation of powers? Quick answer. Separation of powers, legislative, executive and the courts. Who, is in, who should, in a democratic system, elaborate a principle of patient mobility? Who should make the law in a dem democracy, as we discussed it in the morning? The exactly, the legislative power. But it wasn't the legislative because, and that's almost exactly 20 year years ago, uh, that patient mobility has been developed. Uh, so that I think was the 
I think like it's this week, 20 years ago, that the first judgment was given. Um, patient mobility was not developed by the European Parliament or Parliament and Council or if you say that's primary law by the member states, but it was developed uh, by the Court of Justice. Why? Because certain citizens, for example Mr. Kohl and Mr. Decker, citizens from both, in this case Luxembourg, they went to the Court of Justice and they argued we have a single European market. We have the freedom to provide services. It has already been stated that this also includes the freedom to receive services. And elsewhere it has already been argued uh, or decided by the court that this also includes uh, the freedom uh, to receive medical services or health services. And that's uh, when in those judgments Kohl and Decker the Court of Justice decided, yes, we have a principle of patient mobility. So you could say uh, the, the European Court of Justice was paving uh, the way for patient mobility. Uh, and as we already pointed out, it, it should be normally European Parliament and Council of Ministers to set up such principles. Just that they were, again, like for artificial intelli intelligence or for self-driving cars, they were too slow. And only then in, <coughs> so it started in 1998, and only then in the year two 2011, <coughs> Parliament and Council adopted an EU directive, as it's called, on patient rights in cross-border healthcare. So sometimes you can see that the, the, the courts, they take the first step, the Parliament, in this case, European Parliament and Council, those who should uh, provide for those rules, on, they only then uh, enter the scene in a second step. So, <coughs> again, if we have a look at those different types of competences, we can distinguish between exclusive EU competences, so member states have no say anymore, shared competences, so it's both EU and member states, or last, we could also say it's the member states who are still in charge of certain issues, the EU is only allowed to support, to coordinate or to supplement member states' competences. If we apply that, or if we go more into details, if there is a trade war, is Austria allowed to introduce uh, customs duties on, um, on aluminium and on steel in relation to the United States? Would Austria be allowed to do so? It might be against the law of the WTO, so that's another issue. <coughs> but under EU law, the answer would clearly be no. Why? Because everything, all questions which are related to a customs union, which is mainly about customs duties between the countries and an external uh, uh, customs uh, tariff, that's an exclusive competence of the EU. Can Austria reintroduce the Austrian shilling, the former currency? The answer is clearly no, because the monetary policy, not for all member states, so for example not uh, for the United Kingdom, but for those member states who uh, have introduced the euro, who are part of the eurozone, they uh, cannot reintroduce former currencies. Also the common commercial policy, in the morning if you remember I mentioned the free trade agreement with Canada, CETA. Uh, <coughs> it, is it up for Austria to negotiate on that agreement? No, it's not, because it's EU competence. Only if what we can find in that agreement also touches not only about EU competences, but also about national competences. That was, uh, that was your example uh, of one part of Belgium uh, being against CETA. Only if the content also touches upon member states' competences, then they also have a say. You can imagine that the, the, there's a very long list, uh, a very important field, which is the second one, shared competences. So yes, for example, consumer protection, I mentioned that in the morning. We find a lot of very important uh, directives, regulations at EU level, but I also mentioned the Austrian E-Commerce Act, so we also find uh, very important provisions here. Same for transport, environmental policy. You would find a lot of provisions at EU level. And of course, it makes sense 
to work together in the field of environmental protection because pollution does not respect uh, state borders, so it does not the, 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 the polluted air does not uh, stop at the border. Uh, so it obviously makes sense to cooperate in the field of environment. Some of you mentioned agricultural issues or fisheries, also here shared competence, social policy, internal market. Uh, so those are some very important issues where again we find legal provisions at EU level and at national level. So for those stakeholders who enact new law, that list indicates whether they are allowed to make new provisions. What does it mean for you as citizens? Well, for you, that list would tell you whether you have to search for legal provisions only at the national legal database or also at the EU legal database. In this case, you would have to search in either legal database. Last but not least, so also to come back to the example that you mentioned, public health. Yes, that's basically still a competence of the member states. As I said, only tiny pieces, bits and pieces of competences have been transferred uh, to the European level. Also, bless you, education. That's also a national competence and uh, who of you receives an uh, Erasmus grant? Raise your hand. Yeah. Where's the money coming from? As far as I know, partly from uh, the National Ministry of Education, I assume, partly from the European Union. Maybe you get all the money from one bank account, but the money in the end uh, would also come from, uh, from uh, the European Union. And as you can see, in this case, member states would not have a problem with uh, their competence being uh, supplemented or supported by the European Union if they also pay, if they provide for certain rules for student mobility, uh, they wouldn't m most likely have a problem with the European Union acting in this field. But again, the European U Union cannot change the curriculum, for example, of uh, universities uh, or whatever. So that's a very important uh, slide that you should always keep in mind. So whatever topic is discussed, uh, and nowadays no, there's normally no topic which does not have any EU impact, but what people and what journalists should do at the very beginning, they should have a look at those articles of the treaties where that information is taken from, <coughs> and then they should ask themselves the question, well, who is in charge of a certain challenge? Because if you criticize the EU for not acting in a certain field, if they are not in charge, well, it's like if I blame you for any problem which MCI should have to fix, uh, you are not in charge of those issues. So <coughs> therefore, that's a very important overview. If I mentioned, let's just go back, that at the beginning, the EU had no competence at all. So in the beginning, it was not called the European Union, but I, I simplify it. So if at the beginning the European had, Union had no competence at all, it's still the case, and that's very important to, to, uh, to mention, kind of similar like in the United States, that the European Union cannot grab new competences. We already discussed that. The member states, all 28, have to agree to shift new competences to the European level. So the EU does not have a competence to grab new competences. That's not the case. So how did it all start? Uh, well, it all started, <coughs> there is not really a gender balance here, so we only have founding fathers, no founding mothers. Uh, it all started with a, a French idea. Who was that? Well, he was the French foreign minister at the time. Uh, and in 1950, he made a very important proposal. To whom? Germany. To Germany. Why to Germany? For coal and steel, yeah. yeah. So, two questions. 
why did he propose to have a uh, European community on coal and steel? And why did he propose it to Germany? Why not to, I don't know, whatever country? Lithuania, yeah, Austria. They were, I guess they were trading with the Germany for the most. There might have been economic reasons. What else? Because Germany might have been in need after World War II. There might have been a need. Uh, or Germany uh, might have had the necessity to buy coal and steel. Sorry? Yeah, they have a common border, yeah, but they also have a history, a common history. And now all of you are from France and Germany are peacefully sitting mm -hmm. next to each other. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if we go back in history, what happened after the First World War? Is that a good question? Yeah, and? <laughs> yeah, but uh, very important. So, but before the Second World War uh, started, uh, Germany had to make a lot of payments uh, because they lost the f First World War. And of course, you could, and we will come to the notions of justice and fairness. So, even if you deem it to be just or fair that those who start a war or those who lose a war that they should pay for it, and the, wi the, the winning party takes the money, you might deem it fair. You might deem it um, just. But it's not very clever because that laid the ground for the uprise of Hitler and in the end for the Second World War. So the French were very clever, uh, especially the French foreign minister and Jean Monnet, the one who basically drafted that idea. And he said, OK, let's not repeat the mistakes of history. <coughs> Instead of punishing the Germans again, and therefore we already foresee that we would have a next world war. Let's now, after World War II, rather take in the Germans and work closely together with them. Because again, if we punish them, we might have World War III and so on and so forth. So let's take them inside the boat. Uh, let's work closely together with them. And how to work closely together with them? knowing that at least at the time uh, coal and steel were the main ingredients to fight a war. What would it be nowadays? Nuclear weapons, maybe even the internet as such, uh, who knows. But at the time it was coal and steel, so let's take coal and steel <coughs> away from the member states. Let's transfer it at an entity which we call the high authority, today we call it the European Commission. Let's create a community, which is called the European Community on Coal and Steel. As I said, nowadays it's called the European Union. And by taking away the resources of coal and steel from those uh, countries, we make it literally impossible that they fight future wars. There might be heavy fights, but not on the battleground, but at the negotiation tables in Brussels. And uh, that we can tell for sure. Uh, up until today, that, that idea of Robert Schumann and Jean Monnet, it worked out. So there were no future wars between uh, the member states of the European coal and steel community. That was the, me the main essence of uh, European integration at the very beginning. How did it continue? continued with a principle which it is argued that it was already part of the plan of Robert Schuman and this, that plan he delivered in a speech in Paris on the 9th of May uh, 1950 uh, and this principle that already was part of his plan and so this plan the Schuman plan is not only important for the reason why he did it safeguarding peace it's also important for the way what was part of this plan. And this can be very easily explained as follows. What happens if you cook milk? Yeah, it spills over. So the level of the milk rises and at one stage you have to clean the kitchen. Um, I did it, by the way. <laughs> The same can be, uh, or this phenomenon, or the spillover uh, principle, can be also applied to the uh, integration between member states. 
At the beginning, the level of the milk was quite low because it was only about cooperation in the field of coal and steel. I already told you why those two uh, resources. If you cooperate in a, in a context of coal and steel, there might come the necessity that you also cooperate in other fields. For example, not only creating a free market, a uh, single market for coal and steel, but also for other economic resources, so that also they can freely circulate, what we call free movement of goods. If goods can freely circulate, uh, it, there might be a necess necessity that also workers can freely circulate. If students can freely circulate, there might be the necessity to give them a grant, so you need certain provisions, uh, what we nowadays find in Erasmus+. Plus. If not only students can circulate, but also criminals can circulate, well, there might be uh, the need to work together in the field of criminal law. And what is very uh, famous nowadays uh, in this German-Spanish uh, case, uh, Butch de Mon. Uh, yeah. So the European arrest warrant, yes. When I studied uh, EU law in, uh, in Strasbourg, they always told us, well, criminal law, this is the one field, the one exception where the EU has absolutely no say. Well, that was true at the time. It's not true nowadays, because nowadays we have a lot of provisions in the field of criminal law, and the European arrest warrant nowadays is the most famous example, if you wish. So working together in one field automatically, and that kind of was part of the idea of the plan of Schumann right from the beginning, it's not only that they work together in the field of coal and steel, safeguard peace, but it will bring this necessity to work together in more and more fields, therefore making uh, this integration uh, more and more comprehensive. And just by the way, uh, as we have one colleague from the United Kingdom, that's basically the challenge uh, which we have nowadays with Brexit, that there is so much cooperation in so many fields that turning back the wheel of time, so to say, is very difficult because it's like any relationship is very closely uh, connected to each other, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, again said, to lower the level of milk uh, until it's only coal and steel or even nothing. Do you have any questions on that spillover effect or the beginning of EU history? <coughs> I, I think <coughs> it's, it's very important to remember for two reasons. First, uh, even if nowadays we uh, discuss certain challenges, we should never forget that the reason why it was founded and the reason which still functions is safeguarding peace. And if you look at Syria, uh, you cannot take it for self-granted that uh, we live in a peaceful situation. And second, it just shows us that this level of integration has gone quite far. Could we consider the European Union to be similar like a nation state nowadays. No, it's an international organization which works together in a lot of fields, which has a lot of impact on the member states, but it does not go as far as being a nation state because still the EU cannot grab new competences that's uh, not foreseen in the EU treaties. After this very short uh, historic excursus, uh <coughs> let's move on to some other questions. Let's go to the next topic, so to say. We had the International Women's Day recently. Should women earn as much as men? Provocative question. <coughs> more. Or more? More. More, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the statement more because uh, we will discuss that or we can discuss that, we should discuss that uh, when we talk about affirmative action. So Please keep it in mind and integrate it into the discussions. Uh, I mainly saw women uh, agreeing to this first statement. What about the men? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so after you turned around, <laughs> you received a clear yes. Yeah? <laughs> what about the second one, which is the, the first one, but applied to a specific situation? Yeah. I mean, it's reasonable. It depends on what you do. 
Okay, it depends on what you do. Yeah. And if a man would get the same service as a woman, depending, no matter whether it's very long hair and change the color or not, should pay the same price. Yeah. Well, it's all about the man. If, mm. if there's a lot of people asking for, a lot of girls asking for haircuts, maybe I can rise up a little bit the prices so we can pay more and me as an, inter as a, as a, as a businessman get more money. You mean economies of scale or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If a woman works the same as a man, like if they develop the same work, they should earn as much and if they, and if they get the same service in a hairdresser, in a hairdresser they should pay the same too. Yeah, okay, so I think we already elaborated one very important criteria, or two very important criteria. Maybe it should depend on the time you spend. Uh, how much time do you spend um, on the service? Yeah. You spend 10 minutes cutting the hair of a man, and then if you spend 10 <coughs> minutes cutting the hair of a woman, then should be the same. Mm -hmm. So time and resources. So if, if you change, once you have the color changed, <coughs> obviously it's about resources, yeah. it's about time. We can value both time and resources and then... Yeah, because you pay for the service. Yeah. The Skiing season is now mainly over. Still, if you go to the glacier, should foreigners pay the same price when skiing in the same ski resort as locals? Yes. yes. Clear yes? Okay. I don't think so because if you Austrians are the one keeping clean the, the course, you're paying a little bit more taxes maybe for, for the yeah. process to be clean or you know, nice. Yeah. And, uh, and the foreigners just kept like paying the same amount, amount of money as you, it wouldn't be fair. You are, you are the one paying the taxes first. Okay, thank, thanks for the argument and thanks for bringing in also this notion of fairness. Because here you will see we will mainly talk about uh, non-discrimination, but I liked it very much that you already brought uh, or introduced the concept of fairness. Do you agree just to his statement? I get what you mean, but at the same time it's the same as if you were going to go see the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and let's just say you were going to go up in the Eiffel Tower and it's going to cost you more to go up because you're foreign to that country, does that make sense? So they have to preserve the Eiffel Tower, correct? So same thing, it's the taxes. I mean, it plays out evenly, of course. So I don't know, I just feel like they should be the same. Yeah, no, but uh, maintaining the Eiffel Tower with all the French taxes, is, I, I know it has, to ha it has to have a lot of, of maintenance. It's not mm -hmm. as, as extensive as, as ma maintaining like all the Alps, mm -hmm. the, all the, all the ski enclosures. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the same amount of money, and not obviously the same amount of people. So maybe uh, Austria has like, I don't know, the state population that friends have yeah. and, uh, and uh, we have to take into account many things. It's not just skiing, it's just uh, renting the, the skis, uh, the place we're going to ski, if you throw a paper that uh, someone has to clean it. Obviously it runs the same thing but not in the same scale. I like the notion that you mentioned that the balance, there has to be a balance uh, and actually your point or your argument about <coughs> Austrians paying taxes uh, which are used for the ski resorts. <coughs> there was once an Italian case uh, where Italians paid no fees or reduced fees for entering museums. And uh, there were <coughs> EU citizens from other member states complaining. And the Court of Justice in that case decided, well, basically it's a discrimination. And it can only be justified if we have Italians paying museums taxes, which are used for that purpose. and your argument of balance, which then, for example, if uh, it normally entering a museum costs 10 euros, if the amount that they are paying via taxes is, I don't know, 4 euros, then uh, it would be okay, legally okay if they only pay uh, 6 euros uh, because they already paid 4 in terms of taxes. That's the only uh, possibility. Uh, Austrians, I can tell you, pay, pay no ski resort taxes. Still, has any one of you ever experienced uh, such differential rates for locals when going skiing or snowboarding? I mean, of course, it's all thorough, but we don't uh, ride it anywhere. So you yeah. have to know it and <coughs> get it cheaper. And the way how they do it, they try to disguise it. So if you, c if you come there and uh, if you, if you uh, speak the local dialect, which sometimes is very unique, unique even for certain valleys, uh, then you would get a reduced rate, it would not be mentioned. So you see, uh, for example, for the snow card, they had it, they were just uh, posting on a website uh, the tariff for foreigners. 
So if a foreigner goes there, he pays that tariff that is indicated. If you were speaking the local dialect, you were getting the reduced rate. But I've also seen that you have to, if you bring the sheep where you registered, for example, that I live. Resident certificate, yeah. 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 That also works. Yeah. So resident certificate uh, certificate is sometimes required. <coughs> it's also a form of disguised discrimination. We will talk about that in the online sessions. <coughs> but still, uh, it's discrimination. So <coughs> that's the answer basically for this. And so it, it's not the Eiffel Tower, but Disneyland Paris, <coughs> which was an issue uh, some time ago. What about this question? Well, that's human rights. Yeah. yeah, and what's the answer? Mm, yeah. What, what's the answer? Yes, so they should have the same rights. Yeah. You remember the example I, t I gave you? <coughs> uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know. He was just interviewed on artificial I intelligence. If the Bishop of Oxford would be interviewed on that issue, I suppose uh, he would have a different opinion. So just, again, to clearly point out the difference between the legal assessment of such a question, the ethical, and if it's certain, if it's also linked to religion, still uh, the outcome might be a different. Last but not least, if all of us would decide to go to the cinema and see a movie, most likely I would end up paying more than you. Is that legally okay? Is it fair? We get like student discounts and stuff, which I think is awesome. I'm not complaining about that. <laughs> yeah. But to be, I mean, if you're trying to look fair, you know, well, in the US you're considered an adult at 18. I don't yeah. care for, like, train tickets. I'm slightly above 18, yeah. You can go to, like, 25 or something like that for train tickets. Yeah. To me, that's just weird. Like, I feel like um, as soon as you start making your own decisions, you're an adult. And so I feel like all adults, no matter what your age, at a certain age, should be yeah. treated the same. So the student discount's great. And I guess if you're, if you're, I don't know, if you're an older student, like, if you're in your 30s or 35, whatever, are you still considered, do you get those discounts still? Can you help me? Uh, yeah. I think it's 27. 27 yeah. 27. Oh, okay. Yeah, but at least for bus tickets. Yeah. But Yeah. So I think it makes sense for you to get a discount if you are not earning money. Yeah. Or so it seems to be fair, yeah? But it, it is a way, I think, for young people to pay for things they wouldn't pay for if they hadn't had the discount. Yeah. So it's like a way of earning a little bit of money instead of nothing. So if you don't, probably, I don't know, if I didn't have uh, the discount half going to the cinema, I wouldn't go so many times. So it's a way of having a little bit more of you mean it's not only fair, but it also uh, might make sense from a business administrative point of view from the cinema itself. Yeah. yeah. I think it's hard to base it on age all the time because it depends. I don't know if you're a student and you don't earn as much. It's somewhat logical that you might have to pay less, but still you cannot always fit a uh, ticket or bind it to the age because there are also people who I don't know cannot work or earn less than others, and I think it's not good to always um, use age, yeah. 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 If we take those questions, and uh, your statement was already pointing into this direction, n and now I'm only talking about the legal perspective, so for the moment being I'm not talking about fairness, I'm only talking about the legal, in this case the EU legal perspective, one key principle in European Union law is non-discrimination. There are a lot of principles, but I would say that's one of the most important principles in European Union law. We still need to discuss discrimination based on which criteria, whether it's age, uh, sex, gender, whatever. But in now, in general, we have the following definition. If we have two situations which are comparable, as I said, two minutes uh, or ten minutes uh, for a haircut, no matter uh, about the, the gender of the person, if it's just the amount of time and the resources, so we have comparable situation. Now if those two comparable situations are treated in a different way, that's what we call discrimination, or if we have two different situations, so men and women, are, or two persons who get a haircut and it takes 10 minutes versus uh, two hours, and if they pay the same price, so different situations but similar si uh, solution, then also that we uh, call discrimination. So it very much depends on the question whether the, the two situations are similar. <coughs> and as you can read from, uh, from that second quotation, 
was, by the way, a very interesting case about non-discrimination um, in Bulgaria, about the Roma. Uh, obviously, it very much depends on the question, do you consider two situations to be really comparable? And as, as it's stated here, <coughs> and we can leave it open whether that definition always hel helps. So the question whether of whether two situations are deemed to be comparable depends or has to be assessed in the light of all the elements which, ca which characterize uh, <coughs> these situations. It's a very general explanation. The question is if it always helps, but <coughs> obviously it's not only about those, let's say, technical criteria. Sometimes uh, it's always also based on certain values. If you say, for example, uh, homosexuals should be treated in the same way as heterosexuals. So just out of that, let's say, technical, legal definition, you cannot, uh, we would not be able to solve that question. So as I said here, we also have human rights and we need to have a certain understanding of human rights to come uh, here to the answer, yes, they should be treated in the same way. So just to show you how it works, but at the same time to point out it's not only a technical process. <coughs> so just to summarize it, and I would say we make a break after this slide. If, again now using such a mathematical approach, if we can say that the situation of A equals the situation of B, then we should treat A and B in a very same way. If that's not the case, so if the a situation of A and B is not comparable, then we should not treat A and B in the same way. And you can always figure out who is A, who is B, for all those questions. Could you think of any additional example that comes to your mind, having this, let's say, technical definition, if you wish? Yeah. And if you say that if A and B are not in the same situation, you, should don't, you shouldn't treat them alike. I think you can generalize that because you need, sometimes you need to put people on the same level so that yeah. they can even be in the same situation. Yeah. And therefore, I think it's not generally correct yeah. to say so. I'm very thankful for, for this statement because it's the, the perfect transition to our first online session to the topic of affirmative action, uh, you will see that it's mainly about what you just described uh, with this example of sticking uh, a, a euro bill on, on, on the ceiling, uh, that maybe it might be necessary to support someone because in a certain situation he's disadvantaged compared to someone else. <laughs> That's what we call affirmative action. I would not say that affirmative action is kind of uh, the limitation to that. I would say that's just another perspective. That's that you should not discriminate. Affirmative action is that you, on the other hand, try to support someone for maybe similar reasons. But again, just keep it in mind for our first online session. Uh, and we're now going to have a 15 minutes break and then we'll continue right here. Thank you. Before the break, we stopped here with the definition of non-discrimination, again the legal definition, we've not yet uh, discussed more into the into in depth uh, the concept of fairness. What we already had is what you described, uh, and maybe I'm going to copy your example in the future, <coughs> with sticking the 100 uh, dollar euro note on the ceiling, so this notion of affirmative action where we have the actual situation that one party is uh, in a di more difficult situation and now the question not whether to negatively di to discriminate against that person but in a more positive sense whether we should support one group in order to follow basically the same underlying idea to create an equal situation. So, so similar as we had it on the previous slide, comparable situation uh, which should be achieved. So it's I would say a special 
discussion in the context of non-discrimination. It is also one discussion uh, which has started in the United States. And similar like uh, interest rates, so the e EU sometimes seems to lag behind the development in, in the United States. I would say that's also here. Uh, the debate, I would say, has started in the United States. Uh, in the meantime, in the United States, uh, it's also seen in uh, some of a negative way. Uh, the EU situation, for a lot of reasons, is different. Again, we're going to discuss all that in the first online session. Now, if we go a little bit more into details, so I leave aside a form affirmative action for the online session. If we go more into details about non-discrimination, what do we find in the EU legal field? Again, here we are in the legal field. We find one very important provision, which is Article 18 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, TFEU. And there we find a general wording of this principle of non-discrimination. Well, what does it state? Within the scope of application of the treaties, please keep in mind this vertical distribution of competences, and without prejudice to any special provisions, and that would be such an example. And now comes the core principle, any discrimination on grounds of nationality shall be prohibited uh, in or based on this Article 18. So just for that provision, you just need to be an EU citizen, and that's, you could say, a political right. But those special provisions which are mentioned, we do find in the context of the fundamental freedoms. There you always need to be involved in an economic activity, if you remember. And one economic activity would be, for example, if you work in another country, in, an, in another member state, <coughs> for a certain period of time, you receive a certain remuneration. That's the economic component. <coughs> and also then, you should have a right not to be discriminated. So, for example, I, I, we have in our department of management and law, we have several colleagues from other member states, from Ger some from Germany, uh, <laughs> one from Ireland. Uh, if MCI would pay them different wages based on their nationality and not based on qualification, that would be against this principle of non-discrimination. It's not the only perspective, but uh, it's one very important one. As I, mentioned, as I mentioned before, the definition I gave you, that very technical definition uh, of non-discrimination, that's a general definition which applies for non-discrimination based on a lot of criteria. Just again to highlight that here we are always talking about nationality. There are other criteria where we should not have discrimination, and as you can see here, in the next article, uh, Article 18, Article 19, uh, it states that the EU should combat uh, discrimination based on gender, ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. And uh, if we continue uh, to this overview, yeah? Uh, the problem with this is that you end up with like a positive uh, discrimination. Like, for example, you know, this now the big companies are, they have to hire like half men, half women. Maybe just men as preferred or even more as women. Yeah. He gets dumped out because yeah. the one was women. So that's kind of, you know. <laughs> you can see a critical uh, expression. No, it's, it's just like <laughs> mentioning that sometimes it happens the other way. Yeah. And I'm very thankful for both statements because they just show what, what, what your statement and what her statement are addressing. That's the notion of affirmative action. Uh, for example, I know whether you can confirm in the United States. Uh, who else is from the United States? Okay, the two of you. So not only always take you as an example. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether you can confirm in the United States uh, if you want to study at a university. Uh, it might be that based on your ethnic background, it's easier for you to study than someone who is equally qualified but has a different ethnic uh, background. Yeah, that's why if you're um, a minority in the state, you definitely have probably a, a better chance of getting into some of the better schools. Yeah. Um, what about being a woman? For example, not being uh, a, a person uh, uh, having certain ethnic or belonging to a certain ethnic minority, mm -hmm. but what, for example, be about being a white woman? Um, I don't think there's really any prioritization on being a woman yeah. in regards to schools. 
Yeah. Um, I could be wrong, but that's just my experience. I mean, there might be a lot of rules, but. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much getting into school as it, much as it is grants and scholarships. So really, it's really hard. I'm just guessing here. Being a white middle class citizen, man or woman, you're not getting anything. Yeah. I mean, if you're not, if you're not under the line or you're not over the line, you're just there. So we just exist. Stuck but in the middle. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's a fair chance. Our, they look really look at our grades. That's really yeah. all they judge us for. It's not so much of a, a gender like a gender thing. Yeah. Sex gender thing. I was just wondering because I mentioned that, and again, both your statements they uh, go towards affirmative action. We discussed that in the online session. But you will see, uh, I just summarize that in the United States, where the whole debate started, it's more about now having different criteria. It's more about uh, discrimination uh, based on ethnic origin, and it's about access to universities. Whereas in, in the EU, it's more about uh, gender in a different context. Sorry, you wanted no, to. I just wanted to pick an example from a school that I went previously to, which had like. Which was. It in was a vocational school uh, back in Finland. Yeah. So uh, they're like for certain of these like study or degree programs, you would get more points if you were female or if you were male. So for example, if you wanted to study to become a uh, hairdresser, you would get more pay points if you were male. Yeah. Or if you wanted to study to become a car mechanic, you would get more points to if okay. you were female. Yeah. Please integrate that that example. And again, uh, that's why I mentioned that it's very enriching to have such a, a, a diverse uh, group of students. Please try to integrate all that experience, all that examples, then also into uh, the debates, not only now, but also in the online session. And uh, of course, also for, for the presentations, or should you write a reflection paper, that's exactly what I call the third step, the added value if you integrate such examples. So warmly welcomed. For uh, not discrimination based on nationality, but na uh, sorry, um, discrimination based on those criteria, we can see that there are different fields. Uh, so here we have those criteria, and here we have different fields. So one is employment and vocational training. One that would be our field here, education, provision of goods and services, and social protection, what already has been mentioned earlier. And I already mentioned the distinction between EU primary law and EU secondary law. For EU secondary law, we have seen that there are regulations and directives. Now, all the examples that you see he can see here are EU directives, meaning they provide for the basic uh, principles which then need to be implemented in international law. So, for example, if you are discriminated based on ethnic background in all of those four <coughs> sectors, then you would take the, the relevant Austrian provisions on non-discrimination, uh, implementing this one EU directive. So directive, as you know, always needs to be implemented in international law. We also have one very important directive uh, in the employment field for sexual orientation, age, disability and religion, which grants your right not to be uh, discriminated. We have one on the provision of goods and services for gender, one for non-discrimination based on gender in the employment field. Uh, and as you can see, there is a broad range in this matrix where we still lack uh, provisions which protect you against discrimination. Why? So for the simple reason what was mentioned in the two videos. Yes, we have a proposal of the European Commission from 2008, so 10 years old now. Who has to adopt it? Parliament and Council. The Council, you could just read that. I think that was one of the last working days before Christmas. You could uh, read in one of their press statements uh, from the, their meeting that they try to find a consensus, but it's a very difficult issue. Therefore, uh, they have not found a compromise. So long story short, there is a proposal in the legislative pipeline, but it has not yet uh, been realized. So therefore, we still lack safeguards with regard to non-discrimination in a very broad range. So again, it's about religion until sexual orientation, for education, provision of goods and services, and social protection. But, um, I mean, in certain fields, it's quite difficult to distinguish between discrimination and differentiation. For example, uh, in the field of education, there are some 
private schools or a, or a certain uh, religion because the school is stated by yeah. priests or uh, some kinds of yeah. Christian people and also for goods and services because if you're following a certain religion that prevents you to eat I don't know, such certain products <coughs> you cannot um, yeah. create uh, a specific law. I mean, I this is not a form of discrimination. This is, uh, in my opinion, more a kind of differentiation. I would say it's a very difficult legal question which will be solved by the Court of Justice tomorrow because it's uh, a case, Egenberger, which uh, is pending at the Court of Justice and it's going to be decided tomorrow. So I can uh, send you or post a link on, on Sakai or on Twitter. It's about the there was a, a lady who, tri who wanted to work for uh, the Protestant church or an organization of the Protestant church in Germany and they required her to have a Christian uh, ethos. So to uh, have a Christian background, oh sorry, a Protestant background because uh, she wanted to work for an association of, uh, of the Protestant church. And the question is, well, is that discrimination based on religion in the work field? You say no? Oh, well, I was just nodding, mm. but no. I mean, I don't yeah. think so. But I think they're trying to preserve what their heritage yeah. is. It's a very difficult question, which already has been anticipated by in the legal commentary, I think almost uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know by now. I will know by tomorrow and I will uh, post uh, the answer to this very interesting question. So just that you are aware of, you always have to address not only, so not only the definition of uh, non-discrimination of comparable situations can be very tricky, but you also have to keep in mind discrimination based on what? Nationality, gender, ethnic uh, origin, whatever, and in which field. So those are some of the questions that need to be addressed so that in the end we can say, well, is there a discrimination? And is that the last question we need to address, if there is discrimination? No, the question is, can that discrimination be justified? What could be justification? We, we don't need to, uh, yeah? So for example, if you prohibit any um, headscarves or something in yeah. working environments, in some cases it can be justified. If you say, hey, we don't allow any, I don't know, things to wear yeah. on your head. Yeah. The Islamic wheel. We will come back to that example later on. So the two cases that you are addressing, uh, they were the first cases that were decided here. Uh, the third case, so to, this, so, so to say, will be decided tomorrow. This case, Egenberger, and I will post uh, the case on Sakai. Very s interesting, maybe also for the Students' Association, there is no provision, neither existing nor in the pipeline, that uh, prohibits discrimination based on gender in the field of education. Still, if there would be a case uh, where there would be discrimination based on gender in the field of education, I think that the courts would be maybe uh, somehow creative or innovative uh, to find a solution because it's not really compelling that uh, it should be able to discriminate based on uh, gender in the field of education. Do you have an example for um, provisions for goods and services in case of gender? Um, yes, for example, um, and also to, to integrate your statement. Let's assume there is a bar which offers a ladies' night where ladies pay no entrance or get a free drink or whatever. The question here is that uh, discrimination based on gender? Because in this case men are discriminated or you could have it the other way around. And I think there is one key resort around Innsbruck which offers a woman's day but also a man's day. So maybe here it's not a legal problem because Every gender has its own day where they get reduced rate. Uh, there was once also a case which unfortunately was not uh, decided in the end. Um, the Austrian Football Association, they had the objective of uh, making more women being interested into the field of football or soccer. 
And so they, I, I don't know whether it was free of charge or at least the reduced rate that women paid uh, if they wanted to see a, a soccer game. In this case, it was not decided in the end whether uh, that is illegal or not for some formal reasons, but I think it would have been a very interesting case. And maybe there are a lot of other examples where when it's about accessing goods and services, where there might be def differentiation based on gender, and again the question, is it legal, is it illegal? Well, the thing is that the first, the first thing you talk about the, the club, um, I think it also as a business, maybe if you get more women into, into the club, then more men are going to Yeah. And again, you... It's going that way. Always. Always. <laughs> what about the Spanish <laughs> ladies? Does it work? It does work. It does yeah? Work. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, uh, I don't think, uh, a friend of mine told me that in, in uh, some parts of China, they had, they had it the other way around. So men had to pay less than women, so women could go there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, basically, I, I, I don't think that, that, is, that is, obviously, I would like yeah. not to pay. Yeah. But, but just, I'm very thankful for your statement. I just want, again, give you a different perspective. The fact that it makes sense for the company does not mean that necessarily it has to be legal. And the fact that uh, even men like it, if there are more women, because then, uh, or that there would also be more men, just that does not in itself mean that it's legal or illegal. So just to differentiate those different perspectives. Yeah, no, but it's something that so I'm even if it makes sense for uh, one company to discriminate against uh, whatever group of, of, of human beings, does not in the end mean, because for them it makes sense, based on their philosophy, based on uh, profit, that in the end it's deemed to be legal. Yeah. Well, legally speaking, if no one complains, there would be no judge uh, deciding on that case. Yeah. That's in terms of a that's a procedural perspective. But again, just to make you aware that the fact that it happens, or the fact that it makes sense for someone, does not mean that it, legally speaking, it's okay. Yeah. The taxation of pepper because they're normally taxed for twenty percent, and you could also argue, well, it's discrimination because only women need them. Yeah. Well, it is. It might be a practical problem, but also on a theoretical issue, it's a very interesting question, uh, and I cannot give you a, a straightforward answer. Uh, you would have to have a uh, have have a closer look at uh, EU tax law, and I mentioned. The EU does not have competences for taxation in a lot of fields. We do have a directive on value-added tax. So first of all, you would have to look into this directive and see if you find clarification. Second, uh, of course, you could argue that uh, uh, men uh, maybe need to shave, uh, so they have to pay for the races. And I don't know how much, if you take one year, how much they pay for that, how much women have to pay. Uh, so th those would be just so some ideas how you would have to uh, follow this discussion, but I cannot give you a straightforward answer. Is it, is it discrimination, yes or no? But it, it's a very interesting question. As you can see that uh, sometimes in theory it sounds very easy, but applying those principles to a very specific situation can be a true challenge. And like I didn't dare to give you a prediction of how the court is going to decide tomorrow. Also here, I don't dare to say, well, that's discrimination, that's non-discrimination. Uh, sometimes you just can indicate certain arguments, but decide or predicting that will be a clear yes or no, that's sometimes very difficult. <coughs> I think we can, or you can make that on your own, if you just very briefly uh, go through the, those examples we had, and if you just clef classify dis discrimination based on which grounds, which criteria, and in which field. We just make it for your own, just very briefly to summarize uh, what we've discussed so far.
Maybe have place for a uh, for fourth place. Yeah, sure. We just want to move here, maybe. Sorry. Then I don't stand in your way. And if you want, if you want to move over there, it will also be four. What about the first one? <coughs> well, gender and then uh, employment. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Third one. In this case, services, yeah. Next one. Sexual education and, I don't know, like employment or human rights. I don't know. Social protection. Yeah, services. And I put the question mark here. Uh, that's what we're going to uh, discuss in a more extended way in the surrogacy uh, session, in the online session, yeah. So in order not to bias, I put the question mark uh, whether or how we define the notion of a service in the uh, single European market. Next one. H and. Yeah. And finally. And. And services. Very good. Okay. So uh, as I said, non-discrimination is also very much about fairness. You brought in the notion of fairness uh, when you discussed about non-discrimination. So let's now uh, turn to uh, this notion of fairness and justice. What's that uh, to colleagues from the United States? Okay. Maybe it's an eye test if you can read. <laughs> yeah. So it's the U.S. Supreme Court. And up there uh, it says equal justice under law. And here you have a combination of and I'll simplify of the notion of fairness and justice on the one side and law on the other. So uh, I have to another Pingo survey for you uh, and I will just explain the question before we're going to run it. In, I think in th this time one minute would be enough. Consider three children and suppose you only have one single flute to give to them. Again, you can also not get around uh, the question by saying, well, I also have two cars, which I can, or uh, uh, two dolls or whatever, which I can share. So you have only one flute to give to them. And so the question is, which child should receive the one and only flute with three children? A, Anne, because she knows how to play the flute. B, Bob, because he's the only child who has no toy on his own yet or Carla because she has uh, produced the flute, which does not necessarily mean that she owns the flute, okay? She, she just has produced the flute. Uh, please make up your mind, uh, but just opt obviously for one possibility. I think one minute should be enough. Uh, <laughs> before I start the question, again, the, the website is pingo. Uh, UPB, University of Paderborn, UPB.de and then you need to enter a code which again is mentioned here 969375. 
So also those who, are, who have not been able to be here in the morning, uh, be on the website. Okay. Uh, one minute time. Okay, let's see. We have 24% in favor of Anne because she knows uh, how to play the flute. 42% of Bob because he's the poor child who doesn't have a toy on his own yet. And 33% uh, for Carla because she's the one who produced the flute. Okay? Does anyone want to share her or his reasons? Yeah, I voted Carla because like the one doesn't seem that obvious as any of the other children can learn to play the flute. So yeah. And then Bob, I mean we can get another toy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just that there is only one toy so in this yeah, kind okay, of situation. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, but Carla just made it, so yeah. it's Yeah. Like it's unfair. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, she pretty much does what I expect. That's Carla's personal possession. You cannot just take away from her because other people. What if she took my piece of wood and my knife to produce it and against my will, if I'm the owner of, of both the piece of wood and, uh, and the knife or whatever it took to, uh, to well, produce the flute? Then you can have the flute, but you might have to pay her. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, time and efforts clearly speaks out in favor of Carla. Well, at the end, I all want all to be happy. <laughs> and like the, the other two child children, they're all like, still happy because they got toys. And now they get over the moment of not getting the flute. Well, we know that he doesn't have a toy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's why I gave it to Bob. To Bob, yeah? yeah okay. To Bob, because then like, the, the moment of like, Carla will be angry and Anne may be angry because she wanted the flute. Like, they all want the flute. Yeah. And then, like, they'll forget this moment of not getting it, and then after all, they'll still be happy because they, like, now they all got something to play Okay. With. Somewhere in favor of Anne? Yes. And why? Because uh, she's the only one who can use it. <laughs> I, won't, I won't give a uh, flute to, to me, for example. I have no interest in playing flute. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not only no interest, but. No skills and have you have you ever listened to someone yeah, playing the flute? I was thinking about the parents. <laughs> so uh, I want someone to play the flute without <laughs> creating headache. So yeah. so. Well, the that Carla might want to know how to play the flute, so yeah, that's why she produced it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think this is like a way of socialism and capitalism. <laughs> 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 Or I could just give it to Bob, and then Bob could say, well, Anne knows how to play it, so Anne can play it, and then they all <laughs> So you're, again, destroying the, the moral <laughs> dilemma <laughs> by, be, by being very innovative, but still. Um, so let's have a look at this notion. And here again, it's not so much about discrimination, it's rather about fairness. So the question which the parents or one parent would have to decide in this case uh, would be, well, what's a fair decision um, and those three possibilities have obviously not been chosen coincidentally but <coughs> they would reflect different philosophical approaches now obviously very simplified and would get it because uh, according to an Aristotelian approach uh, 
we have to ask about the purpose of a flute. And the purpose of a flute is to be played well. And as it stated here, the flute would presumably contribute most to the further development and exercise of human faculties. <coughs> so she is able to play the flute. The purpose of a flute is to be well played. Therefore, we would give it to Anne. Making people happy. Yeah, the, the you mean even if happy. Alexis or myself would pay the flute, play the flute, and as you stated, and I can confirm, maybe not well enough, yeah, all of you would have <laughs> headache, but still we would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your point? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> children, yeah. Maybe we would be happy, but not the rest of the class. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a valid argument, yeah. But still, it would go. Uh, it would either go into one or the other direction. The second argument is a different uh, attitude, but in this case, not always, but in this case, would go into the same direction. It would be the the headache component, if you if you wish. Uh, it would be a utilitarian approach, meaning creating uh, the, the the biggest good for the greatest number. And obviously, if she would play the flute, it would increase overall happiness, which would not be the case if we, the both of us did it. So that would be an argument to give it to her. For Bob, that would be an egalitarian approach. So everyone should have the same, even if the starting point uh, is a different one. <coughs> so a little bit like we had it uh, discussed it for affirmative action. And last but not least, Carla, that was your point. Uh, she has produced the flute. Again, does not necessarily mean that she owns it. So she could claim the instru instrument, uh, quote, either as a uh, just dessert or else in the name of libertarian conception of just acquisition and possession. So again, different philosophical approaches leading to different, or in this one example, to the same uh, outcome. Uh, but again, there is no single answer, what is the right or what is the wrong approach. So, um, just two books that I want to mention uh, in that regard. One is a very famous one, uh, A Theory of Justice by John Rawls, which <coughs> we're also going to see uh, later on. And kind of based on this book, but further developed, uh, a very famous book by a very famous uh, scholar from, from Harvard University, Michael Sandel, um, who is uh, explaining a lot of uh, philosophical concepts in a very easy way. So if you go to justiceharvard.org, uh, you can uh, watch his MOOC explaining basically uh, everything which is written in this book in a very easy and a very understandable way. So. Uh, I would definitely say reading the book of John Rawls is way more exhausting uh, than reading through this book. That's basically sometimes even funny. Uh, so I can very much recommend uh, especially this book. And I can also very much uh, recommend uh, the, the MOOC that uh, he offers free of charge uh, at justiceharvard.org. Uh, and uh, I have to also to say and to acknowledge that a lot of some elements of this course were also inspired by the book and by the, uh, the lecture of uh, Michael Sandel. If again we take the starting point of the flute example, in order to point out that there are different philosophical ways of determining how to uh, get a fair decision, we also or if we go to the legal sphere in the European Union, uh, and I mentioned that earlier, those questions are sometimes all also strongly linked to the question of certain values. And the values of a society might be difficult to, to be determined. In this case, it, at least in the first step, it's uh, quite easy, because since uh, the 1st of December 2009, with the Lisbon Treaty entering into force, so EU primary law, we have a, at least, a, let's say, a list of the values of the European Union. 
The reason why I mentioned the first step, because uh, in a second step, what we would need would be a clear explanation of what those values mean. So we have a list, we have certain notions, and we are going to see in the online sessions to which extent all of you, and again, here I warmly welcome the very diverse background, how you would explain those different values. And I just assume or predict that uh, all of you, even if you come from the same country, you might have a different explanation or way of explaining those different values. So therefore, at this stage, I'm not going to explain them. Sometimes would e wouldn't even be possible, but just to mention them. Human dignity, what we have seen already, is the first one, and it's not only the first mentioned here coincidentally, but that's on purpose that it's mentioned as the first one. Freedom, remember freedom was one of uh, the terms on the slide of the separation of powers, but there are different ways of freedom. Democracy, we already had that. Equality, very strongly linked to non-discrimination. We also already had the rule of law. We had human rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, I also mentioned with this uh, current uh, European Citizens Initiative, the right of minorities, and that it continues pluralism. Can discuss that if we go to the uh, Islamic wheel cases that you mentioned earlier, pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, might also be, might also play a role in that regard. Justice, so that was now our starting point. Justice slash fairness, solidarity, very difficult to determine. If you think about our last content online session about uh, migration and refugees, so the question of how to relocate them if they all end up in Italy or in Greece, how to relocate them, a question of solidarity, how to define it theoretically, how to apply it in that specific situation, very challenging situation for the European Union. And last but not least, what we already had, equality between men, a woman and men. So I already answered that question. No, they're not clearly defined. Uh, what you understand by those values, we're going to uh, discuss in the online session. And in which fields are they important? Well, I already pointed out to some, but again, that's uh, up for the online session. Let's uh, therefore now turn uh, to law and uh, morality. And also here I want to uh, bring one quotation which I found today uh, in, uh, in the newspapers. It's uh, James Comey, former FBI director, who was quoted here, uh, or he calls uh, President Trump morally unfit for presidency. And I quote him, I don't think he's medically unfit to be president, I think he's morally unfit to be president. And what this example shows us is just uh, what is also mentioned on uh, the next slide, that it might be the case that it, the legal assessment of a certain situation might be different to the moral assessment of a certain situation. So hopefully, in most cases, uh, the way how we morally assess a certain situation, a certain case, compared to the way how we uh, legally assess it, should be the same, but that might also fall, ap fall apart. Well, uh, it does fall apart in the statement uh, of this former FBI director. There is a second case, uh, which did not take place today, but uh, some years ago. That was a, uh, a German case about a politician from the so uh, social uh, or the conservative party in, in Germany. And the question that was, so after this scandal, so to say, was addressed to the readers of this German newspaper, Der, uh, Der Spiegel, that was the following. How do you judge the relationship between a 40-year-old man, th this politician, and a 60-year-old girl from A, a legal, and B, a moral perspective? So that was the question which was addressed to the readers. How would you answer it? What is the legal age to have sex for 60 in Germany? Oh, no. That's the legal question, yeah. yeah. But I will 
I will give you that information later on. What about uh, the moral question? And, and, and obviously the legal question is easier. You just take the, the German criminal code. You have to search for the relevant provision and there it should be clearly stated. In this case it should be easy. Uh, it's a mathematical uh, issue. You have to have the name of the man and of the girl. And then uh, the law should uh, provide a straightforward uh, solution. Unlike the example I gave you with uh, religion and working for a religious association, what is going to be decided tomorrow, that's more difficult. But what about here? Not the legal, but the moral question. Illegal and immoral, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there we have a, uh, uh, we have a parallel situation for, for the legal and for the moral perspective. I think it depends on what they want. Like if you put the thing here. Okay. I think that from a legal perspective, it's quite objective that the girl is is not mature or. Uh, so it's not an equal situation, yeah? It cannot be considered an adult by the system and the country, so from a legal perspective, it's quite objective that this is, this is a considered as a crime. Yeah. And from a moral from perspective? From a moral perspective, it's, I think it's subjective, but I, because I think it depends on, yeah, on the background, on maybe, I don't know, maybe on, on the law between the two. Yeah. That's normally a typical answer of a lawyer if you ask by a student, a legal not a moral, but a legal question, you always say, well, that depends. So <laughs> like my answer to your question earlier on this case that's going to be decided tomorrow. Uh, but morally speaking? I think it depends on the context you met in. So if he's like her boss or a superior to her in the working relationship, then, then that's a strong reason why there should be no relationship, yeah? Yeah. So not a free consent, yeah? yeah. So some kind of consent, but not a free one, yeah. So as you can see, uh, that that was the outcome of the survey, uh, and it was stated here, and you did not have that information. So sexual contacts between a 40-year-old man and a 16-year-old girl are legally okay, but the question is: it morally acceptable? And only 36% said yes, and 58% said no. It's not morally acceptable. So just to show you now with both examples. Uh, that there might be a divergence between uh, them. And I can, uh, also to give you, for example, the Austrian uh, uh, legal situation, uh, there you have an age of 14. It's a little bit more complex, but you can see you can go to prison for up to 10 years. So the different age groups, uh, just to briefly point out to the Austrian situation. <coughs> so to summarize it, we might have situations where law might not equal morality. Now, leaving aside morality for the moment being and, and looking at it a little bit more into law, um, there are certain functions of law. How would you try to describe the first function of law? Providing for some order. What do you mean by order? Just as it's stated here, very general. Yeah, framework. The framework for society, so everyone knows sort of what rituals are to be obeyed and how yeah. you act in society. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if we take uh, the example of your colleague uh, behind you, for example, in the UK, if you drive on the left-hand side, if here you drive on the right-hand side, the function of order just requires that everyone is driving on the same side, but it doesn't really matter whether you choose the one or the other option, as long as everyone drives on the same side of the road. Uh, it doesn't matter, we have this function of order uh, which is fulfilled. Fairness, now again here we have this quotation equal justice on the law or the, the, the idea that we have fair provisions, fair legal provisions. Um, so a function of morality and also a, a, a social function. How would you describe the function of power? Maybe a pro authority that you have some 
don't want to tell you what to do. Okay, the function of authority. Maybe as well that there are consequences if you don't obey to the law. So the, 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 what, we, what we had in the definition of law, the, the enforcement uh, uh, perspective, yeah. So is that law has a function to maintain leadership and especially in constitutional law, when talking about the separation of powers, bless you, bless you. We had, I also mentioned that the courts, if they are constitutional courts, they have the function to control the acts of parliament, that it's not against the constitution, for example, not infringing your right uh, to life, and also the control uh, of power, so power and the control of power, so as I just mentioned, separation <coughs> of powers, checks and balances, so these notions from, from the United States, and constitutional review, so again, a law, that is passed by parliament should not be against your human rights. So now that is law. Uh, if we again come back to law does not necessarily equal morality and if we take uh, now also the perspective of time, uh, the graph is in German because it's taken from a German book, but I'm going to translate it or explain it. So if that's nowadays, if that's very early times, maybe even before throwing Christians uh, to the lions. Uh, so at the very beginning, we had only very little law. What do you guess? What type of law did we have uh, at the time where everyone was sitting around the fire, so small tribes? Uh, what kind of law do you, do you guess did we had at the time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that. What else? Maybe not to kill the people of your own tribe. Yeah. Maybe the answer uh, the, the question was answered in a different way with regard to different tribe, yeah. So as we had it someone <coughs> who is at war with your country, you can send the trolley car <laughs> and kill him. So that was <laughs> one of the arguments early on. So maybe some kind of family law. Uh, children have to obey their parents, whatever. Uh, so there was le very little law, obviously nowadays with artificial intelligence, with self-driving cars, with uh, e-commerce, uh, with di digitalization. Obviously nowadays we have way more law than uh, legal provisions that we had at the beginning. What this also, also indicates, uh, and obviously that's very simplified, he states that uh, at the very beginning there was very little influence of politics. As I said, the one who brought the meat decided and there weren't even rules on uh, democracy because that was just uh, uh, the law of the fittest, so to say. So over the time, the influence of politics has increased. Of course, the bigger the society, the more complex the rules. And what he also indicates is, uh, and you could say, or you can tell me whether that's too uh, pessimistic, that the identity of law and morality has decreased over time, similar as the influence of politics has increased. It's just an opinion, again, uh, I'm not uh, saying that uh, that is 100% right. To some extent it might be right, uh, but again, that's up to you to make up your own decision. So what is the uh, if we take morality and time, what's the attitude of the Court of Justice in Luxembourg? And I said tomo tomorrow they are going to have to uh, decide a question which is also linked to ethics. So your ethical attitude and the question whether you should or should not be hired by an association very closely linked in this case to the German Protestant uh, Church. Well, the Court of Justice basically has the following approach. Uh, the Court states, morality has a cultural, a regional and a temporal component. And it might change over the years, so obviously that develops. And if we take the example of uh, non-discriminatory treatment of homosexuals, that question obviously 10, 20 years ago was answered way different than it's answered today. It also has a regional component, so even if we can agree that, uh, maybe that's just an assumption, that all Austrians have the same moral values, at least on average, still they could be different in other countries and uh, 
That's why I also mentioned that, again, I warmly welcome all your diverse <coughs> backgrounds so that we can have a very enriching discussion. And, as is mentioned here, it's also based on certain values. And again, for the European Union, not for the single 28 member states, I've just mentioned those values. We are far from, or I am far from being able to define or clearly determine that them. So, again, we have a territorial, regional, cultural component, a temporal component, and we have this link uh, to values. So that's morality and time. Has anyone of you seen that movie? Yeah. <laughs> what is it about? No nationality because he's no human, so he's trying to get like that human. Well, it's not only about nationality, but it's about uh, be recognized as a human person, so he can marry, uh, he can legally marry a woman. Yeah, not only marry a woman, but Have children. I'm pretty sure don't they want a baby in the second movie? They also that's <laughs> that's <laughs> taken from the second movie, and they also want to have a child. Yeah which obviously requires uh, some kind of sperm donation uh, in, in his case, but that's a precondition and uh, what he uh, wants to achieve here in that court proceeding is to be recognized as uh, a human being. In which way is that related to our course? I will tell you after the break. <laughs> Ten minutes break. So I guess you're all curious to know what Ted has to do with this course on <laughs> European Union law and ethics. <coughs> the movie was taking place in the United States. Well, uh, the link to our course is the following. As it's mentioned here, it's about law and time. Uh, as I said, he wanted to be recognized as a human being so that he could uh, marry his uh, girlfriend and also then be the father of uh, a child via in, in vitro fertilization. Uh, that's Ted, that's the judge, and that was uh, the lawyer uh, in, in this case. And do you remember what sh uh, how she argued? Oh, no. I no? Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? What was her line of argumentation? Do you remember? What could be her line of argumentation? Again, knowing that it was about the question whether he should be recognized as a human being. He has morals or he has the ability to think. The ability to think, yes, he would have. Morality, mm -hmm. <laughs> slightly more, dif <laughs> more difficult, yeah. Wasn't it something like he's capable of loving someone? Uh, maybe if that would, be, uh, would have been a point, it would been have been easier for him. Uh, because he it seems that he truly loved his girlfriend, but it was rather one argument was about making a contribution to so society, and making a contribution to society in that regard, he rather proved the opposite uh, <laughs> by his behavior. But again, the core line of argumentation in this case was the, or by his lawyer was the following: she argued that so far teddy bears have not been accepted as to, as to qualify as a human being. But her point was, well, that has been the legal situation so far, and now we need to make a new step, and now for the first time, uh, and that's how she tr tried to convince the judge, now for the first time uh, a US law, uh, a judge should recognize the teddy bear as a human being. So that was uh, her argument. We find a similar idea again in the United States, uh, in Washington DC, in the Jefferson, at the Jefferson Memorial. We can see, it, uh, a, as I've underlined it, laws and, law, laws and their institutions must go hand in hand with, the pro with progress. So there are certain new developments, and th that's what's mentioned down here. So similar as you could not require a, a grown-up man to wear his coat, which he used to wear when he was a little child. So also here, uh, society grows, the circumstances uh, grows, and therefore the law has to keep pace with the time. So that's basically, again, law and time. We have had now different combinations, but here, law and time, how also the law should develop due to certain uh, new circumstances. 
Now getting a little bit more serious, but still uh, staying in the United States, I found a very interesting uh, overview uh, in The uh, Economist, uh, July 2015, where, um, the, where they analyzed certain legal issues which have been decided in a different way, again, again, and, and that's very important to be em emphasized, against the background of an unchanged constitution. So the US constitution was the same, but certain uh, is uh, or for certain issues, the pub public opinion has changed, and so you can see here uh, 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 racial segregated schools, bans on interracial marriages, uh, then uh, the issue of abortion, and one of the last examples, uh, same-sex marriage, and so if you read through uh, this quotation while I'm talking. Again, the constitution, the legal situation has not changed, but the courts, as is stated here, were willing to decide the very same question now in a different way if public opinion has changed. And as it stated, uh, <coughs> the judges don't like uh, to go uh, beyond public opinion, but if they have at least half of Americans on board, and I, I assume that's rather uh, generalized, so they wouldn't have three clear thresholds. But as you can see, if public opinion has changed, then the judges seem to be willing to take <coughs> it into account, although the text, the constitution, has not changed at all. So that's kind of what the judge, uh, or sorry, what the lawyer argued here in this, uh, in this movie. And the very same uh, idea that we can find here more uh, <coughs> empirically speaking uh, with regard to the case law, not of the EU Supreme Court, but uh, not, yeah, not of the EU Supreme Court, but uh, about the US Supreme Court. Let's now turn to ethics and uh, philosophy. First of all, uh, ethics and morality. And I have so far used both terms. Uh, although they should be uh, separated. So, as you can hear, see here from one book uh, about bioethics, if we start with morality, so morality we learn uh, as we grow up. So it's about distinguishing right from wrong, wrong uh, behavior. Again, if we take our starting point, uh, the trolley car example, and they are obviously linked to a certain uh, society. We learn about uh, morality as we grow up. Our parents tell us what is right, what is wrong. And then it, we might differentiate certain issues of morality. And you, uh, our Spanish colleague mentioned the, the medical doctors at the beginning. So the decision would be different for a medical doctor than for anyone standing uh, uh, close to the track. And changing uh, the way where the trolley car goes because they, there are some uh, values or issues of morality which only apply for specific groups, for example nurses, physicians, or for everyone. So there might be a difference, but still uh, it's something subjective and it's linked to a certain society uh, and it's also explained how they come into being. On the other hand, so whenever from now on we refer to the term of ethics. Here we have different philosoph philosophical schools, remember the flute example, which provide different uh, explanation concerning uh, morality, but that's the philosophical approach of looking at the topic. Morality is more linked to what was also mentioned in this judgment of the Court of Justice. So this, it has a geographical component, a cultural component, and as you have already seen, also with regard to law, it's obviously, uh, it differs in time. In medieval times, it was okay uh, to burn witches uh, or not to grant equal treatment to women. Nowadays, we clearly have a different uh, attitude concerning those issues. Who's that? Yeah. Montesquieu. 
Ja, yeah, Manuel Kant. That's uh, Jeremy Bentham. That's the author of the, let's say, more comprehensive book that I showed you, John Rawls. And last but not least, so the only one still living, uh, is Michael Sandel, uh, the Harvard professor of this uh, MOOC on, on justice. So if we now, and now I just try to summarize some of the issues which have uh, already been explained earlier, so just to put different pieces together. Um, well, you can see here that one was one of his uh, most important, uh, or one of not, not not only of his, but in general, one of the most important works on uh, philosophy. And what he explained there is that humans always strive to live in a political community. Remember, I referred to the tribe sitting around the fire. And if you then think about uh, the time in Greece or similar situation in Rome, so already having a, a more comprehensive society where you also need more rules. And what he argued is basically that this society needs some kind of order by law. We've also discussed the function or one of the functions of law which is to provide order. Again, driving left on the left or on the right hand side. As the objective, uh, and keep that in mind, so the, that's the, the Greek term telos. Uh, of this political com community is the good life. And one of the ideas, and again, uh, obviously that's very simplifying, is that if we have, in this case, different virtues, so we, here we have an excess, here a deficit, that you have a golden mean between those two extreme pa parameters. And as it was mentioned uh, before by one of you, uh, we should strive for some balance. That's a principle which you can also find uh, in EU law, for instance, and also in other jurisdictions. We would not go for the one extreme, we would not go for the other extreme, but we would, would try to find a balanced solution between different principles, for instance, which are equally accepted, but if they are going in, di in different direction, we have to find a balanced solution. So again, that's simplifying, but I would take that as the essence now for our course uh, of, of him. What he also mentioned is that virtue is something we cultivate with practice, so we become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. And uh, if you remember the flute example, his reasoning is a teleological one. So starting from the purpose, in this case of the flute, so what's the purpose of a flute? If you follow that line of argumentation, of reasoning, uh, so it's not deontological, but you start from the purpose, and in this case of distributive justice, it would decide who would get the flute, uh, again, if we have only one flute to be shared for three children. Montesquieu, I want to keep rather short, so his famous book, uh, De l'Esprit des Lois, The Spirit of the Laws, uh, was mainly, not only, but mainly, as we have it nowadays, uh, about uh, the separation of powers. And obviously it was influenced by the French Revolution and then also had an impact on not only the US Constitution, but we find that principle of the separation of powers, I would say, in almost all Western democracies. Immanuel Kant. So it's not, a mo not so much about distributive justice, it's about, or his categorical imperative is the following. So again, if you, if you imagine all the situations where we try to find a fair solution, so he, he tries basically, again, very simplifying, to, find, to define one sentence would which would provide an answer, or sorry, a solution to all different cases or uh, questions. And what he proposes is you should act only according to the maxim whereby whatever you do could at the same time become a universal law. So if you have to decide whether to lie, for example, to someone, and that's also a very, very famous example he gave, imagine uh, a, fr a friend of yours is hiding in your house because there's someone who wants to kill him. 
Now the, the killer, the potential killer, knocks on your door and asks if your friend is inside your house. How would you react? Mm -hmm. You would not. You would a. You would lie, and b. You would not allow the the killer to enter your house. He argues, of what, oh, and obviously that's very difficult to understand. Uh, but he argues, well, lying can never be made a universal law. It's just wrong in itself. He argues also here it cannot be justified. So we we might agree to the sentence. Uh, in, in another context, but uh, here it might be a little bit more difficult to follow him. What he also mentions, and that's a very important clarification or a very important approach uh, that we will need when we are going to discuss human dignity, for example, when we are going to uh, discuss issues of surrogacy. Um, should we take a woman as a commodity so that uh, a woman rents her womb? Uh, for uh, giving birth to the child of someone else, maybe someone from a rather poor background, a woman from a rather poor background, uh, supporting uh, two parents from a rather rich background. So should women be treated like objects or like subjects? That's basically not only with regard to women, but in general that's uh, what he explains here. So human being should never be treated as an object, but as a subject. And that's uh, a very important uh, clarification. And also if you read through this summary by Michael Sandel, uh, that's a very important cl clarification. And if I mentioned earlier that the notion of human dignity has not been defined, I can tell you that in literature we find a lot of voices which strongly argue that the undefined notion of human dignity in Article 2 of the EU Treaty, what we have seen before, should be filled with life with this idea of Immanuel Kant. So that we find very often in, in literature. You all know that example. There would be a bunch of other examples that I could give you. What happened in this case? Does anyone remember? Yeah? What happened? <coughs> I think it was Chinese or Japanese uh, passenger on the airplane. It was, it was, yeah, it was a I man of... It happened two <coughs> times. <laughs> yeah. Nearly two foot and two knees with the United Airlines. And I think the plane was just overbooked and... Uh, was it the fault of the passenger? No. <laughs> no, it was the fault of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of United yeah. Airlines, yeah? Someone And the decision, uh, how was it enforced? Yeah. Rather cruel, yeah. <laughs> and it was a man of Asian background. He was EU citizen, as far as I know. So there were also accusations of discrimination based on ethnic uh, background. Uh, he was a medical doctor. Why did he want to take that flight? Does anyone? Having a patient. <coughs> having a exactly. Uh, so it was a good reason for him to, to be on the flight. It was not his fault. Uh, and the way how he was uh, taken out of the aircraft uh, clearly would infringe this way of treating human uh, beings as subjects and not as objects. Again, there would be a bunch of other examples. There are also some recent uh, decisions uh, of the Austrian Supreme Court concerning uh, um, a youth center in the same street uh, down there uh, which has just been decided uh, recently. So it's always about the question of if you should treat human beings like subjects or as objects. That man, I think, as far as I got it, no one of you knew Jeremy Bentham. Uh, he is one of the, uh, the one of the philosophers which are linked to utilitarianism. So that, if I may <coughs> shorten it, that's basically ide the idea, and we had that argument at the beginning of today's course. Yes, saving the life of five is better than only saving one. So, again, what is the decision that brings uh, uh, the greatest uh, pleasure to the biggest number uh, of people? That's one approach, uh, which obviously can find its limitations in 
this philosophy. But again, those are just some ideas, just that you have some food for thought and uh, again, we're going to further discuss those issues in the online sessions. Um, John Rawls, this book, Theory of Justice, what you can see over there, a uh, very famous book, uh, which is about uh, fairness. And uh, basically, what he argued, again, I try to summarize it and to simplify it, he argued that uh, whenever we discuss about fairness, it very much depends on our current background. If we are very rich or rather poor, uh, from which country we come, how we define fairness. If we tend to be rather rich, we would not be, uh, let's say, communists. Uh, if we are rather poor, we might, we might uh, be the other way around. And so what he proposed is a kind of thought experiment that you have a wheel of ignorance. So once you're born, or you go through this wheel of ignorance, and so you are at a status where you don't know what your life is going to look like afterwards. And so being completely unbiased, uh, he argues that in that status of not being biased, uh, we should uh, decide for what is a fair decision. Again, especially when it comes to distributive justice, so like the flute example, what should be given to whom. So if we talk, or if we discuss issues of taxation or other issues, where we take away from someone and give to someone else, uh, then uh, this uh, approach could help. Similar as I mentioned it for Immanuel Kant, if in general you try to define justice in one sentence, or several sentences, how difficult that might be, we have here uh, his approach. He says, first of all, each person should have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar scheme of liberties of others. So that's the first principle. And then, so we are striving for an equal situation. However, if there should be inequalities, uh, so social and economic equalities, they are to be arranged so that they are both A, so two preconditions, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, especially to those which are worst off. And second, that uh, positions and offices, so again it's about distributed justice, are open to all. I'm not going to explain it in further details, just uh, leave it as it is. Uh, for all the different topics which we are going to discuss in the online sessions, just try to keep it in mind, as I said, first step, second step, and then hopefully also in the third step, you will be able to integrate that in your presentations or reflection papers. Um, last but not least, so that was chron uh, in a chronological order. Um, when also, or especially when it comes to the question what we should uh, distribute in a society, uh, Michael Sandel argues that we need to make uh, to, to uh, take up some, some substantive uh, moral questions. And what he also argues, we need to reason together. So it could not only be one philosopher, but we as a society, depending on how big or small we define that society, we need to reason together about the meaning of the good life and even if there might be uh, disagreements. And I think that's also very important. Justice is not only about the right way to distribute things, but how also how we value things. So again, linking values to, uh, to um, the question of what is the right decision. And so what he argues is that a just society needs a very strong sense of community. So similar as we have already seen it for Aristotle uh, and the way how we cultivate it. What he also argues, and we are going to see that uh, um, in the fourth session, he argues that we need a public debate about the moral limits uh, of justice and also the moral limits of markets. There's a second book which I can very much uh, recommend to you What Money Can't Buy, uh, very interesting book uh, where you also have um, 
a very short uh, summary in, uh, in terms of a speech he once gave at the London School of Economics. And what he also mentioned in this context is uh, a, let's put it this way, challenge in our society, uh, which he calls the skyboxification. What's a skybox? Exactly. So in previous times, everyone, blue and white color workers, were sitting uh, in the same sector, uh, all eat eating the same uh, sandwich or the same drinking the same beer, whatever, uh, and they uh, were mi uh, mixing uh, up because there were there was no uh, differentiation based on your income. Nowadays, uh, we have what he calls skyboxification. So. We, you don't meet people of different classes or you tend not to meet uh, people of different classes anymore. So if there is a too great gap between rich and poor, that undermines solidarity, uh, which is very important for a democratic, uh, democratic uh, process. And I remember what has been described concerning uh, the United States some years ago, so that we have a country which is strongly divided between two uh, parties. That was seen as a problem with regard to the United States. I would say nowadays we also have that situation, that challenge in a lot of uh, uh, countries in Europe. And so he argues, and again it's a little bit simplifying, and or I am simplifying what, what he states, that uh, that's also due to this fact that we uh, tend not to engage in a joint discussion. Obviously that's easier in a small community in Greece than nowadays in a big country. Uh, but still, he sees that as, uh, as a challenge. And if we link that to the last statement that I provided here, he says, a more robust public engagement with our moral disagreements, even if we disagree, could provide not for weaker, but for a stronger basis for mutual respect. So just the necessity to engage in public uh, debate. It's also, if you remember, one of the uh, objectives of this course, active citizenship, uh, so that's another point uh, that he advocates for. Presenting philosophy in just a few number of slides, I I'm aware of that fact, definitely is a challenge, but I just tried to put certain bits and pieces together which we've seen based on those examples. And as we already had it uh, in today's discussion right from the beginning, let's now not only look at law and ethics or morality, but also religion uh, to complement this view. Again, I want to start with a uh, real case. Uh, that case was about, as I said, the single European market. You know, we ha do have in the European Union a uh, single European market. We have not only the free movement of students and workers, but also a free movement of goods. So what I mentioned uh, when I referred to the plan of Robert Schumann and, and Jean Monnet. Um, and this case it was a very early case, so from uh, 1986. So at the time, uh, Germany and the United Kingdom were members of the European Union. And so this case was about uh, the seizure of uh, by the UK customs authorities of certain goods imported from Germany by this company. And obviously if you have free movement of goods, you should be allowed to import your uh, goods without them, they, them being confiscated by the authorities of uh, the country of import. The, pro uh, the problem in this case was uh, that uh, the products were not uh, tables or whatever but there were, uh, as it's stated, uh, um, inflatable dolls. And the argument of the UK uh, customs authorities was that those products are indecent and obscene and therefore they should not be imported uh, to the United Kingdom. So if we have law, free movement of goods, and we have the argument that it goes against the public morality in the United Kingdom, how would you solve that case? We have free movement of goods. 
on the one side, and we have the argument from the UK authorities that it goes against uh, public morality uh, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, but in the EU there, is no, there should be no sex dis sexual, sexual discrimination or something similar. So since it's, it's allowed by, by the law and there is the free movement of goods, why it shouldn't be important? So so you would uh, refer to the, uh, the hierarchy of law. Yeah. You've seen EU law is on top, so free movement of goods is on top. And then we have national law, so <coughs> no matter whether that's the moral uh, view of uh, the United Kingdom or whether that's also part of their laws, but it doesn't matter, EU law prevails and therefore they cannot take that decision. Everyone agree? The question obviously is who defines what qualifies uh, as, uh, as unmoral, if I may put it this way. Uh, what do you say, should that be up to the United Kingdom or to the European Union to define what is unmoral? And as we have seen it before, if morality might be different with in different cultures, uh, it might al also change over time, as we have seen, but as I said, th this case had to be decided uh, at one stage, so in 1986. But what I mentioned earlier is that morality can differ in different countries, uh, based also on different cultures, linked to different values. So, again, just as a general question, who should it define morality? Should it be the European Union or should it be uh, the United Kingdom or the member states? There is no right or wrong answer, just what is your personal view? Well, I would say the member states because, like, uh, as you said, it's based on, like, culture and, yeah. and differs with regions. So who are, like, some other people to say what yeah. I think is morally right or wrong? And the European Court of Justice, in this case, uh, had a similar approach. So that it's not for the EU to define what is morally right or wrong. I have to add that the EU values that I mentioned earlier, as I said, they have been added to uh, EU primary law uh, in 2009. So they did not exist at the time. So that's what we also have to keep in mind. But uh, the court stated, uh, yes, although we have a restriction on the free movement of goods, that can be justified based on grounds of public morality as, and I quote, in principle it is for each member state to determine in accordance with its own, again they did not exist in 1986, with its own scale of values, so UK values, and in the form selected by the requirements of public morality in its territory. So clear answer and uh, we have a lot of case law nowadays uh, in the field of gambling because gambling falls under the freedom of services. So nowadays the cases are rather in the field of gambling, especially online games. Uh, a lot of companies located in Malta because they're more liberal and offering the services here, for example, in Austria and Germany. So yes, it's still up to the member states to decide on those issues as long as we don't have a situation of double morality. And that was the interesting part about this case, uh, as in this case, the UK authorities only applied a very strict notion of morality with regard to imported products, but the very same products could be tra freely traded uh, in the United Kingdom without any problems. So therefore it was not really an issue of morality, but of double morality. And that's why, although this statement as such is very important, it can be upheld unless we don't have a situation of double morality. If that's the case, then uh, the country would lose, uh, would lose this case. So that's a very important statement. I already mentioned when it comes to non-discrimination, what we discussed earlier, that there have already been two cases in the field of religion, in, uh, in the field of employment. 
And what I have to say is that there have been a bunch of cases concerning different types of the Islamic wheel. Uh, cases in this field, so to say, have been decided by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So that's not the Court of the European Union. That's the Court concerning the European Convention on Human Rights. So that's closely related, but it's a different story. Just to clarify, the two cases which have been decided on the very same day were about the Islamic wheel, so only this situation. That's just to tell you uh, that there are also a lot of cases concerning those examples, but they stem from the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, not our court in Luxembourg, and also the Austrian Supreme Court had to rule on a different of the other cases. So what were those two cases ab about? And let's start with the first case, which was decided uh, roughly a year ago. Um, Ms. Uh, Achpita, she worked for this security company and at the time where she started, there was an unwritten rule that workers should not wear visible signs of, and I quote, political, philosophical, or religious beliefs in the workplace. So they, they applied the policy of neutrality and they said, with regard to those three uh, issues, political, philosophical, or religious belief, we want to have a policy of ne neutrality. Three years after she start work, started to work for that company, uh, she informed her line manager that she now, uh, as of now, intends to wear the Islamic headscarf during working hours. And the work, Works Council of that security company then uh, approved an uh, amendment to those uh, workplace regulations, which again state that there should be neutrality with regard to uh, political, philosophical, or religious beliefs. She was then dismissed uh, because she uh, insisted to uh, wear the Islamic wheel. And how would you define, how, how would you decide that case? If a company who wants to be neutral with regards to three issues, and you have a worker which insists that she wants to wear if you decide to work in a place, you have to follow the rules that yeah. manage, the, the, the one managing that, that, that company. So, so I would say like the company has, has the right to say yeah. that nobody can. And would, if I just take your statement and transfer it to tomorrow's judgment, should that also mean that a, uh, an association linked to the German pr Protestant church, that they can <coughs> state, <coughs> we want uh, only have we only uh, want to uh, uh, employ workforce which has the same belief as our association. Would that be the logical consequence? Or would you say that's a different issue? Well, I think <coughs> the same issue well the other way around. So yeah, uh, but it should be, s it should be decided in the same way. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I was just like thinking that uh, I agree on the part that it's fine for the employer to say yeah. uh, these things, but I feel like it should have been said before, or it should have been like a written rule or a policy. Uh, so you say it might be okay, but the way how they expressed it, that's still improvable. Yeah, or I, I feel like it's weird, weird that they like made it a uh, rule after she announced it. Well, it was already a rule, but it was not written. So like we had it for customary law, it might be qualified as law, but the challenge is that it's not written down. Yeah, so it's just maybe orally communicated now in this case. When you say unspoken, do you mean that it was like when they sat down with their interviewer and had the whole shebang, are you saying that they said to her, by the way, we're completely neutral? Exactly. So it was just verbally. Verbally, but not written down. And then it was, was an, an official amendment, and then it was written down. Gotcha. Okay. But then she knows about it, so. She knew about it, yeah? So display of, of religion or whatever, then you could be discriminated against because you can't find a job because everyone is, is doing that because they don't want to have this display in their job. Okay, so that's an actual challenge for, in this case, for Islamic women. Yeah. yeah? Um, I also feel like it shouldn't, uh, like it 
should be allowed for her to wear the hijab because um, it's not like it, you can see that she's a Muslim, but it's still it's neutral because she wouldn't try to I don't know talk about the talk about her religion because she has so she, so if she does not try to convince other people yeah. to change their religion as long as she doesn't engage in such activities, uh, it would be okay. I think it depends on if it has an influence on the work. Because uh, there is also another case within a court, if it's allowed to, be, to wear a hijab or whatever yeah. in courts. And I think the ruling was, no, it isn't, because it's a neutral area, kind of bubble, and therefore <coughs> it's, not a, uh, it's allowed to... Um, Anyone yeah. wear like that. Well, here we have to differentiate, and there have been cases of the Strasbourg Court, not of the Court of Justice, that's the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, but of the Strasbourg Court, there have been cases where it was about, for example, the question whether the judge would be allowed uh, to wear any symbols of religion. Yeah. Uh, that's a different issue uh, than, for example, if you have someone who is accused, and uh, if uh, in the court proceeding the judge also has to assess the way uh, has to see the face to to uh, to come to a conclusion whether that person is lying or not. Uh, in this case, obviously, you have to see the face, and there have been uh, clear statements that in this case uh, you're not allowed to cover your face. Uh, but wasn't it also for workers? So for court workers are not allowed to. Because I think also for security uh, reasons, it might be of some influence because they have to decide whether someone is allowed to clap yeah. or not or whatsoever and if someone wears a huge cross and there is a Muslim or you or whoever and say no you are not allowed to come to the yeah. and, and might be also yeah. discrimination. So the, the kind of cases that you are referring to they actually have been decided again not by the Court of Justice of the EU but by the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and uh, those were Again, cases where, where the Strasbourg Court has given a clear answer. But now coming to the answer of the Court of Justice in this case, uh, religion was not defined in this directive we have seen uh, earlier. The court took a similar uh, approach as the Strasbourg Court, say, saying that well, there are two perspectives. The internal perspective, just the fact of having a certain belief, but also, and that was the issue in this case, uh, what is called the forum externum, so also the, the perspective that you can show your belief to the outside world. So both is covered uh, by this notion. And what the court then stated, and that has been criticized uh, by some, uh, as I said, finding a balance, we have freedom of religion on the one side, on the other side we have what you can find in Article 16 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the freedom to conduct a business. And obviously, they are both at an equal level, both rights, and now we need to find a balance between the right, the human right of the company and the human right of that lady. So we need to find a balance. And this religious neutrality, as such, is a legitimate aim to potent, or in theory, to uh, justify such a policy or policy whereby you're not allowed to show your religion. However, and those are very two very important limitations, it has to be appropriate, meaning uh, you have to apply this policy of neutrality to all religions in the same way. And that's where a very interesting discussion started, where could you have a Christmas tree around December and at the same time uh, telling people that they are not to sh that they're not allowed to express their religion in terms of what type whatever type of clothing so that's the first precondition and the second one what we call uh, necessity assessment the question is if you want to show that your company is neutral, obviously it makes a difference where that person works. So uh, if this person has a lot of contact with customers and with regard or in relation to customers, the, com the company wants to be neutral, 
then obviously maybe there are less restrictive measures, for instance, offering a job in the back office, uh, which would be less restrictive than firing, uh, uh, firing this lady. So those are, as you can see, a very technical approach, I would say, to this very fundamental question of law, religion and ethics. So it's a very technical approach referring to human rights, providing for a balance, and applying two principles which we can find very often in EU law. So the principle of proportionality, not going beyond what is necessary. Um, in France, uh, it was summer one year ago, uh, there were then a lot of uh, discussions. So for example, it was called the heading, the Bukini is not compatible with French values. And uh, also taking now the legal perspective, there was in, uh, on the island of course, there was a, a judge saying uh, that Burkini ban is legal. You might have also heard that the Austrian government is thinking about prohibiting uh, the hijab in for, uh, for girls up to the age of I think 10 years in schools. Obviously we are here not talking about discrimination based on religion in the workplace, so therefore uh, that's a little bit a different issue. The underlying uh, challenge is still the same. But just again, and I'm, uh, I don't want to convince you of any uh, solution. I just want to make you aware of the fact that we might have a legal solution. We might have a moral answer on those questions. And the perspective of religion is still a different one. Um, as we are coming to the end of our course, I want to go very briefly uh, through uh, this case. It's about a topic which is very controversial in uh, Europe, not so much as far as I got it in the United States, that's genetically modified organisms. There is a directive on genetically modified organisms which also refers to the notions of ethics, as you can see here. Uh, there has also been an ethics advisory board which was involved in the drafting of that uh, directive. And long story short, the directive was adopted and obviously it applies for the whole European Union. Poland uh, did not, didn't implement this directive, as you already know, necessity to impl implement the directive international law. And they did not implement this directive and so they had to put forward reasons why they failed to implement the directive. And now I'm cutting short. Uh, they basically, if I may summarize, argued that uh, both politicians and citizens in Poland are very strongly influenced by the Christian conception of life. So uh, harmony between man and nature and Again, just based on the public opinion of Polish people, uh, this directive uh, goes against their public opinion, therefore it should not be implemented. How would you decide such an issue? Could you bring forward the public op of opinion of a country in order to get rid of legal obligations? So again, here we have a clash of a legal obligation and the perception of morality, in this case in one particular country. No? Why not? Well, because just because the majority <laughs> doesn't really approve one thing, it doesn't mean it's the right thing, so it shouldn't necessarily be legal. Yeah. That's democracy. Isn't that similar to the case of the inflatable dolls in the UK? <coughs> so the moral of a mm. single country, the moral rules of a single country. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for comparing this case to the other. So there we had a legal obligation, free movement of goods, but at the same time in law we had the possibility to, to have an exception to that principle. So public morality is one of the reasons of justification, as we call it, to deviate from the principle which is free movement of goods. Here that was not the case, and again as we are running out of time, I am going to uh, cut short. The court clearly stated here we have a legal obligation and there is no exception to the requirement to implement the directive into national law. That's why you cannot take arguments of morality
to get rid of a very clear and precise obligation, which is to implement the Directive International Law in due time. And there is no exception, so therefore you cannot take morality to get rid of a legal obligation. So uh, that case would have been the possibility for the court to give a lot of very interesting statements, but the court restricted itself to a very technical solution. Uh, and as I said, it was the following. Now, if we summarize that, as we, it was clearly mentioned in the Congate case, it is not for the EU to define morality. That has to be done at the national level. Still, nowadays, as long as it's not double morality, uh, we also have the EU values. So nowadays, or step by step, that statement in Congate could maybe in the future be slightly different because th the stronger we have a definition of EU values, also taking into account what Michael Sandel said, we need to collectively discuss about issues of morality. The more this happens, the more we fill the values with life, the more maybe uh, the decision would not be taken at the member state level, but nowadays maybe a little bit more at EU level. Not only at the interface of law and morality, but also religion, uh, that can sometimes prove a little bit uh, tricky. And for ex I don't know if any one of you remembers, uh, especially in France, there was a big discussion when they drafted the European, uh, sorry, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. There was a big debate whether there should be a reference to God in, uh, in the Charter. The, especially France was strongly against it, if you read through the, the protocols. And therefore, <laughs> how they solved it was a linguistic one. So all the language versions refer to the spiritual and moral heritage of Europe. And only the German versions refers to religion, but none of them refers to God. So that was <laughs> the linguistic compromise they tried or they, they uh, found for this very controversial issue. Um, so the headscarves cases were about Islam, the Polish GMO case was about Christian and humanist uh, conceptions, I didn't mention those. Uh, and similar as other courts, as I said, also the Court of Justice is very reluctant to decide on fundamental issues of society. Why? Because again, in this separation of powers, it's rather for Parliament not for the courts to take those fundamental uh, decisions. And that's basically the summary of the GMO case. So that's, as I said, the basis, the first step. Uh, we are then going to discuss uh, questions of affirmative action in our second session, or our first online session. We are going to discuss issues of surrogacy in the next online session, especially about the concept of human dignity. We're going to discuss moral limits of markets and then in the last content online session, the topic of uh, migration uh, and refugees. And again, I'm go basically going to uh, moderate or conduct those uh, sessions. The Q&A session should, uh, that's really uh, the possibility for you to get a coaching, to get answers to questions, because if that's the second step, the purpose of all that is that in the last step, presentation or reflection paper, you can put all that together and again create an, uh, an added value. That's it. We are now at the end uh, of this session. Again, please make sure, go through all the, uh, the information on the slides in terms of technical requirements uh, for Adobe Connect. As I said, uh, if we are in the online session, I cannot influence uh, any technical challenges that you might face. So therefore, I can just point out to the importance that also you maybe you go through the fact sheet that I posted in the first announcement uh, on Sakai, so that you go, th you go through all the details. The summary can be found on the slides. Please make sure you have a functioning headset, uh, that you uh, don't use a firewall, that you don't use a, a smartphone, and then hopefully uh, we have no technical challenges and then we can concentrate on the content. See you online.